Hello and welcome to the society with Fatma Shaheen at PTV World. Despite the fact that Islam, of course, doesn't encourage divorce and despite the fact that we are an Islamic society, unfortunately, we have seen a divorce rate to be on a surging high in the country. Why is that the case? This is something upon which we'll be shedding light during the course of today's conversation. Overall, we'll be talking about the various socio-economic factors which do contribute as to this rising rate of divorce. We'll also be talking about the fact that why women more are, you know, by that virtue, prone to seeking a divorce or hola, as perhaps was the case, you know, a few years or perhaps even a decade ago. In this regard, we'll also be talking about the fact that, you know, how does Islam particularly view the entire concept of divorce? whether it emanates for that matter from the husband or whether it is something which is then initiated by the wife. We'll also be talking about the psychological impact of divorce, not only on the divorced couple per se, but also on their children. And we'll also be talking about how this increasing divorce rate at large has actually impacted the society. And last but not the least, we'll also be talking about how particularly can not only the education system, but also the society at large, you know, successfully work so as to re reintegrate or for that matter successfully rehabilitate you know survivors of abuse people who have had unhappy marriages back into the society all of this today that too with a very imminent panel let me introduce you to my today's panel my first panelist for the show today is Sheikh Jahangir Saab who is an Islamic scholar Salam alaikum sir and welcome to the show alongside him I have Ms. Rabia Malik who is an educationist Salam alaikum ji and welcome to the show thank you for inviting me you're most welcome and via telephone line, we'll be joined by Jahan Ara Chuktai, who's a therapist. Salaam alaikum ji and welcome to the show. Thank you, Fatma, for having me. Uh, sir, now to get the conversation started with you, something which I just mentioned in my introduction as well. First things first, when we do talk about Islam, when we do talk about religion, for the clarification of the audience, please tell us how is it that Islam particularly views uh, this concept of divorce, whether it emanates from the husband or for that matter, whether it comes from the wife. Uh, the reason we all know, we've all heard and we've read that Islam dislikes the divorce. It may be the most disliked of all actions, which is halal. Because the reason when people come together is to be happy. People don't get married to be unhappy. Hmm. And uh, it is so important that they take the utmost care and hmm. make the utmost effort to make this a happy home. Hmm. And this divorce ought to be the very last of all the options available. Right. So why we say that this, this can take place, mm. it is required, and sometimes divorce is the best option. Mm. It gets better than living in an extremely abusive or toxic relationship. It right, could be for sir. both of them. Mm. It doesn't have to be the woman only. Mm. And uh, they want to get out of that situation when it becomes the better life. Mm. But till such time, mm one ought to make the most effort to make it work. But do you not feel, sir, then that when it comes to the younger generation, perhaps there has now been a greater shift for them choosing to prefer their individual preferences, going with what they feel is right in a marriage even for that matter, rather than thinking about the collective good of the family at mm. large, perhaps children as well, if there are any children in the wedlock or even the society too, because in the larger picture, sir, we do see divorce being something which impacts the society's fabric too. It does inevitably weaken the family system of any society. The, the thing is, uh, we have a million reasons for that happening today, uh, with this new generation, but one thing which is most painful and the most real in my opinion hmm. is the fact that perhaps their parents haven't given them a good enough example hmm. to look up to. Hmm. So if I look at my parents and my uncles and my aunts, everybody's unhappy, everybody is fighting all the time, there's so much toxicity in, in, the, in the family, hmm. negativity everywhere, fighting on every happy occasion which seems to be nowadays the thing to do. Hmm. And I think that is the biggest reason why we are pushing away our new generation from marriage itself. On which I'll come to you, Madam Hey, we must take your narrative too. So how do you in Pakistan see the divorce trends evolving over a period of time? What are the various uh, psychosocial determinants of the same? Because there have been studies to actually suggest the fact that women generally are more prone to not only initiating khula, but educated and career-oriented women, especially those who are in an economically viable situation 
situation they might do so more so would you as a woman yourself rather as an educationist to agree with the findings of this report uh thank you for the question fatma um i'm going to agree to what shakes up said i believe marriage is a beautiful institution hmm. but it's not something that is perfect and it's never been perfect i mean we've grown up watching not just the current generation but also our parents and the generations between before us True. they also had problems hmm. they also had toxic marriages but the only thing that was probably keeping the families together was that women were not financially independent hmm. our mothers were not educated they did not have most of them did not have careers hmm. that's why they were bound to stay in the marriage because they could not because they wanted to take the children away and because they could not support the children that's why they decided to stay with you know within the marriage so a woman who is economically empowered would of course not take into any kind of abuse that she is subjected to and there would be greater chances of her walking out but on the contrary this would in turn also contribute towards the divorce rate yes that is true it is uh, as you said it's a double sided sword the basic you know problem that we see in marriages these days is that there's a lot of inflation mm -hmm. couples are unhappy because you know there's uh, a lot going on in the world and mm -hmm. you know financial uh, crisis lead to unhappy marriages one very big factor i hope you both agree is that you know uh, inflation is causing a lot mm. of you know fights within the houses previously women were not empowered they did not have jobs but one thing is that you know uh, women sometimes need to be mindful of how difficult and how challenging it is to become a single parent mm. and the double side sort you know kind of strikes then when they think that they since they have a career mm. they will be able to you know support and you know take the children or just you know sort of like walk out of the marriage mm. and yes that is a relief mm. that tends to be successful for a lot of women but it's not something that does not come with challenges because I, i agree with you on that because then they would just be considering the economic aspect of it not the social aspect yes. of it yes. right madam your point is noted which i'll come to you ms jahara when we do talk about divorce and other angle which we must touch upon is the fact that there needs to be trauma informed policies there needs to be trauma informed care in place and this is definitely something which must just not emanate from healthcare professionals professionals like yourself this is something which we must see reflecting across the board so in this regard how trauma informed do you generally feel are professionals uh, with regards to divorced women i think one of the issues that we keep seeing um i think working with other professionals and I i'm talking about therapists here is that many people from the legal side to the medical side uh to even the healthcare side they're not aware um on trauma informed practices and this is a word that's becoming very popular i think these days in the mental health community generally in pop culture you know trauma informed and i think a lot of people uh they come to me because i have trauma informed uh you know certifications and experience i think it's really important for um people to have a, a trainings uh, like for example we work with so many doctors uh, and so many gynecologists and they are not trauma informed at all so you know they're uh, talking to clients in ways that are uh, you know more damaging than they are helpful people are asking questions in ways that are more victim blaming than they are helpful um i think part of the training of from the legal staff to the police staff to even doctors their part of their training needs to include uh understanding mental health like it needs to be a mandatory course uh for them to take and have conversations on because honestly it makes our job easier and it makes the client feel more supported because you know we could do all of this where we could provide the best mental health care but yet when they go to uh, you know their lawyer or their gynecologist or their doctor or you know other people that they're interacting with in the system they are again getting uh damaged uh that's very rightly put by yourself madam but moving on another aspect on which i would want you to delve upon is the fact that when we do talk about actually diagnosing trauma how particularly is that done because a lot of times we see that a people more particularly women they perhaps might not be that open in having these open conversations about their impacted mental health something that i often tell people is that when someone who is for example in a domestic violence relationship comes to me the biggest issue is that they don't know they are in one they are going to usually come in with you know 
सो जहाँ रहा आई एम हैविंग यू नो दीज डिसोसिएटिव एपिसोड और आई एम हैविंग पैनिक अटैक्स और आई यू नो पुट द कीज समवेयर एंड आई फोर गेट वेयर द कीज आर और आई एम जस्ट हैविंग दीज मेमरी गैप्स और यू नो वट एक्चुअली आई हैव एंगर मैनेजमेंट इशूज और देर डिफरेंट कंप्लेन सो देल कम इन विद सिम्टम्स मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स दीज वेमेन एंड मैन दे डोंट नो दे आर इन अ डोमेस्टिकली वायलेंट रिलेशनशिप और दे डोंट नो दे आर इन अन अनहैपी मैरिज दे आर कमिंग इन विद सिम्टम्स एंड सो मोस्टली दे सी दम सेल्व एज द इशू और दे सी दम सेल्व एज द कोर ऑफ द इशू सो आई ऑलवेज यू नो बिगिन टू स्लोली स्लोली एज वी गो इन टू थेरेपी एंड वी बिगिन टू अंडरस्टैंड एज दे बिकम मोर कम्फर्टेबल विद द काउंसलर दे विल स्टार्ट टू रिवील डिफरेंट थिंग्स एंड देन वी फाइंड आउट दैट मे बी दे आर बींग यू नो फ्राम निगलेक्टेड टू अब्यूज टू टॉक्सिसिटी and all of these things are really uh, present there um i think it's really important to understand that there are different stages um uh, of trauma related issues right so we have dissociation we have ptsd uh, depending on the kind of trauma we have lots of depression you know so women will come to me and say you know i've just lost my will to live or i've lost you know this ha- i was so um motivated or i used to be this really confident person in college and school and now i'm just like i'm not like that anymore so we have to really understand many things in the context of trauma and you know what these different survivors at different stages are going through divorce is a big grief it's a big grieving process you know even if someone is trying to get out of it they are still grieving the loss of a connection a loss of a uh, you know a potential love story a partnership the loss of families the loss of structure you know there's your whole world changes it would be fair to say when somebody has endured that traumatic experience of going through a divorce the trauma is not something which of course needs to be treated but there are a lot of things which actually add to it because they might be in an unhappy marriage they might have been subjected to abuse for a long period of time which might of course have led to all this a sir on which i'll come to you when we talk about the role of arbitration when we talk about the importance of reconciliation we understand that this is something which has been stressed upon in our religion islam as well so when we talk about the role of arbitrators how has that particularly been defined is it just limited to ensuring that both the parties they sit together and they work towards a uh, finding a solution or does it also go a step ahead so as to ensure both the parties they know of their respective rights and responsibilities in the marriage because that is perhaps something more long term i think there's a huge gap between what arbitration should be hmm. and what it is at the moment hmm. right now i been in i've been involved myself in certain you know such positions and i've hmm. seen people in these positions all the third person seems to care about is hmm. his own time or her own time hmm. and they somehow want to blame the women mostly hmm. that you have to be patient and you have to be tolerant and it's your job it's a woman's job i think it's both people's jobs right my my take is it's both people's job they both have to be patient they hmm. both have to be understanding they both have to be pathetic but society puts a lot more pressure on women to be so which is very unfortunate sir sir but when we talk about the role of the arbitrator to yes. my understanding the approach is that there should be one person from the uh, respective spouse's side one from the husband's side one from the wife's side so that it is an equal power play at mm. the end but in the event that neither of them can participate then mm. who would on whom can we possibly shift the responsibility of being the arbitrator in marriage then the state or the uh, judge in question can become the arbitrator right. now our law is where society is that's very right because even when you do initiate divorce proceedings it is the judge who t- actually takes upon that role so when it comes to the role of education how do you as a distinguished educationist in your own right feel that education can actually help us uh, more particularly help young girls who have been married off while they are studying so as to not only cope with different challenges but also at the same time also help children so as to better cope with stress if they do come from broken homes right um for that fatma the curriculum has to be revamped while we have a very uh, very effective and a very innovative curriculum now mm. for pakistan and the the uh, the education industry has worked very hard for the past 3 years on the national curriculum but what's missing still is you know sort of module or some uh, components on social emotional development of children mm. we've seen uh, for quite a few years now that children are the most affected of depression and mental health issues amongst the whole whole population of pakistan mm-hmm. you see
obviously, uh, we, we speak about uh, broken marriages, we speak about toxic relationships. What we don't talk about is the children who are getting That's affected. That's very right, because a lot of times, the entire stress is on the parents. Exactly. Basically, not on the children and how that may in turn impact it's, it them. It seems like that. Right. It seems as if parents are going through a living hell, and they are. Hmm. But you see, it's of their own making. Either hmm. you chose that spouse or chosen hmm. for you. Hmm. But the children, they are the innocent bystanders and in all this. Right, hmm. which is very sad. But when we talk about the same thing, we also understand the fact education can also be that one factor which can yeah. actually help us offset child marriages because that in itself is of course a very glaring social evil too. So how do you correlate that? with their right to seek education. It's very rare that, you know, married girls are still going to school because mm. uh, that's where, you know, education comes to an end for them. Mm. And what happens is that um, because, the because the curriculum of Pakistan or it is, is not equipped with empowering children, I'm not going to just talk about girls, but children about entrepreneurships, about, about uh, livelihood, about financial but literacy. But we have seen positive developments happening, Rabia. I do remember some time back, a life skill education was actually introduced to be part of the curriculum. So there have been positive changes which have been happening. There has been, um, themes have been introduced into the curriculum, but you know, a, a curriculum or like a component that hmm. actually focuses on this is still right. something that is missing. Hmm. And uh, it's something that can be brought into the curriculum and let's be I'm very hopeful that you know we'll get there somewhere but the point is that you see now the uh, the world has taken a shift from jobs to entrepreneurship mm. so if you know from the very beginning you empower children with the knowledge of you know not just relying on or waiting for the degrees mm. to be able to you know sort of land a job and the you know the job market is also saturated so it's mm. not likely that everybody's getting a job in Pakistan mm. they could start thinking about you know starting something small from home right uh, what we're doing with the British Council is that we have a project called EDGE. It's mm. called it's EDGE, which is short for English and Digital for Girls Education. It's a it's a you know it's a program where we have three modules, and all three modules modules basically work for girls only, and mm. we try to empower girls not just in English language skills but also digital literacy. Right, which is the need of the hour. Yes. But here, one one important question which then arises is that when we are educating them about digital literacy, we have to ensure that they have that access to technology yes, too. Yes. So there are so many factors which then of course come into play. On which I'll take you on board, Jahara. Here we must take your narrative into account as well. So when we do talk about the advancements in technology, in a, uh, the ever evolving changing role of social media. How do you see social media at one end not only educating people more about social issues especially that of divorce but at the same time also making those people more particularly women who do choose to walk out of unhappy wedlock more prone to victim shaming and victim blaming. I think technology and digital platforms they have a huge role to play um it's it's the biggest weapon uh, in the century you know uh, social media and technology and i think it's really important for people to put their stories out there and put their narratives out there and talk about and educate you know what is it like for you know men and women going through divorce or domestic violence or going through different proceedings i mean i think even um educating people on the use of affirming languages from you know loved ones to professionals what does affirming language feel like so for example uh, throughout divorce proceedings many times people are really shaming women especially mothers regarding children uh, you know oh you are breaking the family or you are you know um, your children are really going to suffer or they're going to come from a broken home and I think being a therapist I can very confidently tell you that children from toxic homes have far worse mental health than children from broken homes right so if a couple is really constantly fighting or or even unhappy, they don't need to be fighting all the time, or they're very neglectful, or they're very absent. It has far more consequences uh, for the children's mental health than if the couple was separated. That is much, much healthier. Uh, so, you know, we see lots of mental health issues. I work with lots of, so I think even, you know, sharing things like these uh, on TikTok or on Instagram or Facebook, this is really helpful because honestly, it's, it's that people don't know. Sometimes people say uh, very shaming things based off of great intentions 
information, but they just don't have the facts right or they don't have this information. So I think in that way, social media can play a really big part. Even, you know, talking to people about what is the stages of grief look like. So what kind of grief is a, 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 a someone who's going through divorce going through, you know. Right, Jahara. But moving on, do you not feel that one positive which has emerged over a period of time, that awareness which has been created because of social media is the fact that generally there is now more acceptability of uh, people perhaps uh, choosing to walk out of unhappy wedlock. So what would you say on that? Um, I think unfortunately divorce trends are still perhaps what they were many years ago and the reason I say this is because the culture uh, of asking people to stay in unhealthy relationships is still very strong. Um, there are so many women who will, you know, contact their families or tell them that, you know, I'm in a very unhappy space or, you know, my husband is, you know, maybe violent with me. And the response is not one of, you know, I, you know, we want to protect our daughter and you should, you know, leave that environment and come home and be safe or, you know, we will support you. The response often is, you know, just tolerate it. The response often is just go with it. Or the response often is, you know, people have been through worse. And these are just very, very horrible and toxic things to be saying to people navigating that process. Um, you know, honestly, from the lower social class to the middle class to the higher earning class, regardless of what resources people have to get divorced and also you know getting a divorce requires a lot of uh, you know privilege resources money uh, you know social context but there still is you know it is not something that's encouraged it's really something that's that's looked down upon and but i will say uh, fatma that um there is some level of awareness that is increasing that it could be a healthy option, uh, I think, for people who are unhappy. On which, sir, I'll come to you here. We must talk about uh, the statistics of various South Asian countries, some of which attribute the fact that they have lesser divorce rates compared to our country just because the joint family system particularly is more strong there because even if the couple wants to end that marriage, the joint family system is something which then kicks in. It can be perhaps kind of a safety net. But why do you feel over a period of time we have seen more of the middle income strata tilting more towards divorce? Is it because of greater urbanization? Is it because you feel the typical gender roles they have evolved? I think that gender roles have changed drastically. Middle class people are now expecting the wife to work as well. Many girls are already working. Hmm. Doctors are already working. Hmm. There are many women who are already running businesses. Hmm. And this gives them a sense of uh, empowerment, hmm. uh, which gives them the authority perhaps to be on their own, or at least the illusion hmm that in this society they can be on their own, it's difficult. Hmm. I would like to add something here as well. Yes, please. When women start making money, hmm. in our society we start to uh, you know, call them women of perhaps lesser character. And, you know, hmm. She speaks out now and hmm. she talks back to me because she's got money. Hmm. But why shouldn't she? Hmm. You see, it was not uh, your, uh, it was not her privilege just to be, be looked after by her father or her hmm. brothers or her husband. It was the responsibility of the husband. Right. Now we've started, hmm. we've converted that into the abuse of power hmm. that since I give you money, therefore hmm. you should not talk back to me. Right. Right. This is something that has hmm. to be changed. Hmm. So, so when you say that the gender dynamics have changed, then this is something which men should be equally cognizant of because women, if they have become more educated, if they have become more economically empowered, then men need to accept that too. Mm. by virtue of what you're saying then. So, but another issue that I would want you to delve upon is the fact divorce in the event that it does happen. What happens there onwards? Because if you were to see the laws, unfortunately, there isn't provision about women getting post-divorce alimony payments in Pakistan. Neither do they get that right to have an equal division of assets. So, in Islam, how is this concept of post-divorce maintenance of women seen, more particularly those who perhaps might not be that financially empowered, all that category of, you know, destitute, abandoned women? Well, uh, the responsibility of looking after the women, it may be a daughter, hmm. it could be a divorced daughter or a divorced sister or hmm. divorced mother, hmm. is on the respective male counterpart. Right. He has to look after. Now, mm. I'll give you two ex examples of that. Mm. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he insisted that mm. the most haste you should do mm. for things 
amongst the most things is first of all a daughter who has come back either she's been divorced hmm. or she has been widowed hmm. she must be married off and to restart her life hmm. not just to, be, to pass on the responsibility to somebody else right. but actually to make her life restarted leave back the toxic life she right. has just been out of hmm. the second thing is it's very interesting hmm. and the prophet says the law said that every penny you spend on your family is a sadaqa hmm. you get reward from allah for it hmm. and the highest form of charity a sadaqa of a good deed hmm. which is rewarded for hmm. spending money is on the daughter who has come back right so but then again the question comes up which is that do we see that being observed in practice because islam as we all understand is a very pro women religion islam was one of the first religions which gave women that right to initiate a divorce khula so to speak and this is something which came very later onwards in the western world even if you go back into the history and study it but when it comes to protecting women's post divorce rights be it financially or even otherwise to what extent do you feel as a society have we been able to do just that i think that we have uh, not evolved but degenerated as a society hmm. in the last 50 years in in my lifetime we have gotten worse actually hmm. and technology hasn't really helped us at all hmm. and that's i do agree hmm. but i do ask this question in all my you know talks about women hmm. that yes islam has given these rights islam has given so many rights to women Hmm. but have the muslims also given those rights right That's so it question. comes back to the society at large on which i would want yes, you to comment actually, since uh, coming from like a generation where i have um, uh, even from personal experiences and friends and you know acquaintances around me where i see a lot of people getting divorced i just like to add that the it period of it that just like shakes up said that hmm. you know uh, the man supposed to provide for you know the three months and then uh, that's that's a reconciliation period hmm. that's a time when you know even if you know you got divorced because you thought hmm. that even you know out of uh, anger or you thought it was enough and but that 3 month period actually made both of them both of the parties realize that no it was better and more comfortable together hmm. that's a time when both parties actually play a very positive part and try to make up to each other so that you know they can get back together but what hmm. happens in pakistan is that we spend those 3 months hmm. fighting with hmm. each other trying to you know sort of like um, character assassinate each other we hardly see people reconciling exactly. in those 3 months basically yes and the families also play a very negative role and you know it's just like the and it has to when it it's too late when it goes to an arbitrator which is the court in this case but moving on another aspect on which i would want to comment upon is the fact that we do see countries more than one divorce teachers are also given that leverage especially when it comes to their work now we do see divorce teachers in not one rather various countries being given that leverage with regards to co-parenting with regards to perhaps some time off uh, so as to better adjust the trauma that divorce does bring with it but when it comes to addressing all these unique challenges that divorce teachers perhaps might be facing in a country like ours to what extent has our education system overall been able to tackle all these issues uh, they have not and they must uh i'm going to say this because you see in pakistan uh teachers in the private as well as the public sector are have very low wages i think one and a half children or maybe two children's fee is waived off from the hmm. school and uh what happens is that you see although it's a, it's a sort of like um a reward for them hmm. but then again it's not like their salaries are any good hmm. so and what happens is that when these children go to senior grades the uh, the compensation and the rewards tend to stop as well what and uh, what schools need to notice is that this is the population that is the most dedicated in within the schools because uh, as, as you know and as an educator as it is it is a very noble exactly. profession exactly i've been a head teacher and my preferences were always to hire mothers because mm. you see they would stay for their children mm. because they see that you know their children are their fees are being waived off they were going to work harder they want to stay and if you have a good school system they're going to stay for their children mm. so these are the women who need more you you know more uh, let's say a more uh, wholesome they need more discussion and, that and way. discussion of and course. more you know say compensation, compensation compared to, to right. like anybody and and understanding that, too that in light of the challenges that sir has rightly so pinpointed considering that as per law at least yes
the divorce alimony payments those will be limited they don't extend post the idhat period and until unless comes somebody is you know period. of course suing their respective husband uh, claiming past maintenance yes. but then again you see um, we don't even get you know women who are divorced they don't even get that um, equal contribution in the marital assets of whenever course. they may so be divided so these are the issues that we need to actually focus upon on which i'll come to you miss jahan and so working as a therapist how cognizant do you find the average pakistani person out there with regards to not only the traumatic effect that divorce does have on people but also how domestic abuse also impacts them and tell us why is it so important then at a very basic level to understand the fact collaborative efforts where various stakeholders are coming together to work on a particular social cause are definitely the way forward they are the ones which are definitely more impactful rather than individuals working in this regard so as to make a difference I think in order to best support uh, domestic violence survivors we need to have more campaigns we need to have more um, you know education around what domestic violence is um i think a lot of people think that they know a lot about domestic violence but the more i work with people and the more i collaborate with others it feels like they know less and less about it because on the surface you could say domestic violence and you know you could be sitting among um you know 10 people and you know 9 out of 10 people will say yes of course we know what it is but actually people don't right there are so many things like emotional abuse financial abuse uh, other things that are happening without the consent of the partner in the relationship that are are present that people are just not aware of and because they're not aware of it they're not able to name it and because they're not able to name it they're not able to advocate for it or support it because they don't really don't have an understanding um i think one uh, collaboration i wouldn't say but something that i was locally doing was i was working with the punjab police and they've really started something called a vso as a, a victim support officer someone who sits in the thanas and the police stations and works with complainants and this was really good because prior to this um uh, you know when uh, women were coming in with their complaints they had to uh, give those to male uh, police officers and you know male police officers ke sath it was it was so difficult for them to write those complaints to really completely be honest and all of that so recently i was part of a um, a trauma informed training where we were kind of teaching them how to collaborate how to talk to survivors so you know these things i was so happy and i was so glad that someone is really considering this an issue and wanting to spend money and time and trainings on this so i really think we need more collaborations like this um in order to you know better serve the community and and better really put this message out there on which i'll come to you sir so what would you add to what she said because here i feel that when we do talk about collaborations when we do talk about educating people at large about various social issues be it that of tackling divorce be it that of domestic abuse here religious leaders like yourself have a very important role to play because we did see even during the covid-19 times religious leaders they actually used their power so as to bust so many myths which existed around the vaccination so in cases of divorce how can leaders like yourself do just that well i of course we can't deny the power that uh, the religious leadership has in the society hmm. and uh, i myself I, i in fact run the world's biggest uh, uh, ulama leadership program mashallah and uh, in that program we also insist on pre marital conversations hmm. we want uh, the ulama to talk from the masjid and talk in their lectures about and run workshops and i think hmm. it's not just all ulama but teachers educators and Everybody. social leaders hmm. they should also uh, run these pre marital programs hmm. that's a very that's big so step that's so right sir hmm. because we don't even know what we're getting into you know so because you see most of the focus is then on the wedding festivities uh, the getting the right dress getting perhaps the right makeup artist on board it's not about the nikah nama hmm. i personally feel as a lawyer that if you were to read that marriage contract properly if you were to understand the terms and fill them out accurately there are so many issues that you could possibly avoid so why not focus on that awareness yes so it, it It is the responsibility of the ulama and also the alimat. There are there are tons of them in Pakistan, by the way. Hmm. And I think they should not only have pre-marital, hmm. but also they should tell people more about what marriage actually is, hmm. what it stands for. Otherwise, all I am learning is from maybe my parents' toxic relationship or things around me, hmm. or my main teacher is Netflix. Hmm. So, what do we expect? 
you of know, course. Because on ground, mm. it's different altogether. Mm. That help just doesn't help us save the institution of marriage. But sir, another aspect that I would want you to comment upon is the fact that we also see once women are divorced, or for that matter, if they are widowed, and if they do want to enter into a second marriage, then this is unfortunately something which is just not thought to be very welcoming for them. They perhaps might be judged for doing the same. And this is something that we don't see happening to the male counterparts. Mm. So what is the Islamic stance on divorce? women or widowed women wanting to remarry again? Well, the Islamic stance is that they should get married as soon as possible. Hmm. And therefore, in the Iddat, while the Nikah is not possible, an engagement is possible. Hmm. For example, the widow's Iddat, is no, is no reconciliation hmm. of widow, right? Hmm. Hmm. So she ought to be, ideally, she ought to be engaged within that period. So as hmm. soon as she's done with it, should have started a new life. Hmm. Now, I think in our society, this uh, anti-widow and anti-divorcee you know, attitude is deeply embedded in the hypocrisy of the society. Right, sir. On which I'll come to you. So, what would you add to what sir just said? And in this regard, keeping in mind the younger generation now, do you feel that over a period of time, there's generally been greater acceptability of widowed women, of divorced women entering into a second marriage? Uh, or do you feel that that societal pressure, that peer pressure, or that typical mindset of okay, what will people say, that is something which predominantly, unfortunately, still um, impacts decision making in this regard? Uh, no, uh, not really. I, I really, uh, in my opinion and from my observation, I have not seen a rise in, you know, young, uh, divorced or widowed uh, women getting married easily to uh, men. And I just like to, you know, sort of, I picked two very important points and I just hope like I, I wouldn't go back into, you know, or ask, talk about how, what could be the grassroots solutions to actually mm. help uh, young the gen young generation especially men mm -hmm. think or uh, get motivated to to you know actually embrace women who come from that sort of a background is that you see um, Jahara spoke about TikTok mm -hmm. and she so spoke about the social media mm -hmm. and she spoke about you know uh, his council where they're basically uh, you know sort of talking about uh, uh, issues pertaining to divorce and premarital, uh, mm. you know, sort of uh, circumstances and mm. things to talk about mm. or think about before you but get you married. But you see, all of these factors would then come into play, something which earlier Sir very rightly so pointed out, when the upbringing of the child is such, when the upbringing of the boy is such that it actually gives you that confidence, it gives you that tolerance, it gives you that acceptability of accepting such women. Yeah, yeah. Because you see, they say, give me the first two years of a child's life and I'll give you the whole nation. That is a very famous quotation. So, somebody will definitely be a product of mm -hmm. their family and this is something yeah. which would equally apply in case of men too. But I beg to differ. You see, we are different from our parents. I am not my parents. You are not your parents. And but Shisha, fundamentally, some of the core values yes, that we've do. been taught would be the same. It, that's where education comes in. Right. We educate them. We use the social media and we bring in knowledge coming from people as learned and, you know, sort of, uh, and wonderful Islamic scholars like Sheikh Saab himself, hmm. where, you know, sort of use technology more pragmatically and proactively to more actually... More progressively. Yes, more progressively so that hmm. we condition this generation into thinking that you know this is uh, uh, that divorce is not a stigma hmm. or an, a widow is not you know excess baggage right. so you need to embrace them it's, or for it's that a, matter the fact that there is life after divorce exactly yes on which sir I'll come to you and moving towards the end of the show so what role by and large in your opinion can media play here and I'm not just talking about social media I'm talking about electronic media I'm talking about print media I'm talking about dramas theater talk shows so as to break free of the typical stereotypes stereotypes and taboos which do unfortunately still surround divorce in our society today? Well, because I think that media has emerged in the last half century as the biggest educator, hmm. you know, of our time. Hmm. And we learn and we infer so much from it, hmm. all of us do, especially our children. I mean, I mean well, my children at least because they're all grown up now. Hmm. Uh, what I think that what the role they ought to play again and what they are playing different, hmm. but what they can play is to at least ensure two things for our mm. or our children our future one ensure systems for our own mental health mm. i think a lot of this toxicity comes from parents actually a lot of mm. uh, bad marriages are inherited from your parents mm. so that is one thing that i think that the media and of course media will use their own people they will use leadership from religion from mm. society otherwise so one is mental health mm. it's very important you can't have a happy family right. mentally not well and the second thing is, uh, we should 
decide on certain core human values. Hmm. I'm not insisting on a certain religious value. Hmm. Talking about core human values right. like like empathy, hmm. like compassion. Kindness. Like, like kindness hmm. to uh, each other, hmm. like tolerance. Right, sir. On which I would want to add tolerance, at least in my opinion, would be the foremost because a lot of marriages are actually falling apart because of a lack of tolerance. On which I'll come to you, madam, and before we conclude today's show. So, taking forward what Sheikh Sab actually said here, then, do you not feel that it's equally important that whereas of people today, those who are actually seeking separation or divorce, uh, they not only keep their individual preferences in mind that way, but they also think about the collective good of the family, of the children and in the larger picture also the societal fabric so to speak when they are actually thinking of proceeding with a divorce because this is unfortunately something which impacts the entire institution of marriage. For us as a society and Pakistan as we all know and as we all understand is one country which holds very steadfast to its family values to the institution of marriage. Absolutely too, Fatma. Um, I'm going to, you know, sort of on this, you know, uh, use this platform to probably advise young uh, women. Mm. And uh, in a, and I'm, when I say this, I'm going to give also like a, my personal example as well. Mm. If you are ready to walk out of a marriage and for whatever reasons, not going to say that, you know, uh, I'm not encouraging women mm. to walk out of the marriages in any way, but you see if the circumstances are very difficult for you to and for your children's mental health to stay in a marriage. You must think about a couple of things. You must think about whether you are ready to provide your children with a safe environment, whether mm. the environment that you're taking your children from this current one, mm. is, it, is it sort of like, you know, is it wholesome enough? Is it safe enough for them? Mm. Is it something where they're not going to where their traumas will not be triggered? And mm. it's, it's something, you know, it's not an out of the frying pan into the fire situation. Mm. Whether you have enough money to support, because you see divorces can be, uh, can be very, very dangerous uh, business. I mean, you see, mm. you have to fight for maintenance. It and, can be a long yes, battle economically as well. Exactly. Yeah. And the mm. law, Pakistan's law does not really, is not very supportive of, you know, giving women a lot of money. And in even terms the maintenance of, that yes, you get is very is, meager. Yes, it's very mm. meager. So are you ready to provide for the children if, and while you're waiting for the maintenance to start coming in, hmm. do you have enough money for to, to take yourself and the children to mental health specialists? Because I'm sorry, but that's also, you know, it's, it's a fee and it's, it's an expensive thing in Pakistan. And then do you think that hmm. this situation, the situation that you're landing into is going to be more comfortable and better for you? not just in the first three months where you feel like, okay, I have my independence, I'm mm. peaceful now. Have you thought about the, you know, the, the long-term long -term consequences? Term consequences? Mm. Are you prepared to do that or not? Because it's not easy afterwards. Right. It's not. Right, Rabia. To which, sir, you wanted to add something. I want to send out this message to the families of divorced women and mm. men, of course, mm. as well, especially mm. women, mm. that she is in a very very delicate situation and mm. so are our children mm. sometimes many a times families will accept their own daughter as a victim and show her love and sympathy and whatever but they will not extend that courtesy to the children of, the, of that that woman or that daughter True. or sister mm. blaming them somehow for what their father did mm. so please welcome your child and their children back mm. into your arms with love and understanding Right. I think, sir, that is something we aptly put and thank you for saying that basically. Yeah. But coming back to you, I feel this again is a decision which must rest with the respective parties because we can't just be judges of people's individual marriage choices, of the individual preferences. But of course, one must not ignore the collective good of staying together too. Your point is well taken. On which I'll come to you, Ms. Jahara, and before we conclude today's show, it's very important then to have your narrative on this too. What do you feel in conclusion? should be mental health care professionals like yourself or the society at large too uh, so as to work towards preventing divorce per se? The first and foremost thing is to understand that getting a divorce uh, in terms of mental health is going to be better in the long run than staying in a constantly unhappy situation. When Let's suppose if a couple has uh, children, right? 
the children are growing up with mental health issues the mother and father are both not even in the right mental health states to be providing good parenting or to be providing good kind of safe environments for those kids um it's really really important for loved ones to support uh, you know and friends and family to support in this process so many people uh, families of you know survivors will end up asking them again and again and again about the divorce again and again and again about the trauma and one thing that we know about trauma is that repeating it again and again does not make it better right so we want to be very mindful of that and i think just creating the space where people get to survivors get to bring in their stories when they want to uh, not when the family wants them to bring it in right uh, not shaming mothers again not shaming fathers um there are not a lot of um men who come in to deal with divorce than there are women and i think we have to look at that from a patriarchal perspective where a man doesn't lose as much after divorce than a woman so it's extremely essential for loved ones to also encourage uh you know their sisters mothers brothers whoever to seek therapeutic services and to seek a safe space where they get to explore all their you know difficult emotions that may be very hard to bring up with family because you cannot bring up everything all the time with family uh, so it's important to get a professional right madam your point is noted on which note i would like to conclude today's show thank you so much sir thank you so much ms rabia and thank you so much ahara for choosing to be a part of today's conversation uh, while well, to conclude today's show we generally spoke about the ever evolving and ever changing divorce trends as they do stand in the pakistani society we also spoke about the factors which have actually contributed uh, to this rising divorce rate as it does exist uh, whereas generally we have now seen younger people more open to you know not only divorcing the respective spouses in the event that they don't get along with them uh, what is equally important to remember is the fact that at one end where is of course people do have that right to walk out of toxic and abusive relationships what they must not forget is also the fact that this definitely is something which needs to be treaded upon very carefully on that note signing off for today until next time take care and allah hafiz